Hey, great. Well, welcome, guys. It's um, such a privilege to have you in our building tonight. Welcome to LICC um, for our event, Working for a Culture Shift. Um, I want to say thank you to the band. Weren't they great? Yeah. Uh, these are a bunch of guys um, who are currently at Worship Central who kind of informally go under the name Graham Road, which is where they live. So if you want to look them up on YouTube, uh, please do. Um, I hope you've found the food. If you haven't yet, it's in the side room. Um, do keep munching. And I should say extremely briefly that the fire exits <laughs> are here and the door that you came in and the loos, gents to the left, ladies to the right. Brilliant. So I wonder who invited you here tonight. It was probably one of these groups. And the probability is that if you were invited by one, you probably don't know who the other one is. So um, we thought we'd just do a very brief introduction to the two groups um, and explain why we have this common ground um, and interest in culture. So first to LICC. Um, LICC stands for the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and it's probably older than most of us in this room. Um, we had our 30th birthday last year, which is older than me. Um, and we were founded in 1982 um, by this guy, John Stott, who, uh, <laughs> who said, ooh. <laughs> so a man of many talents. He, um, at heart, was a pastor and for many years led All Souls Langham Place, the church down the road. Um, also was a theologian and prolific author, wrote over 50 books in his lifetime, which is rather impressive. Uh, he was also chaplain to the Queen for 50 years, which I think is a great job. Uh, <laughs> one day. <laughs> one day. Um, and in uh, 2005, he was in Time magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World as number 80. Um, so, a man of significance uh, in this country and abroad. And why did he found the Institute? Well, um, really he had a heart for this thing which we call double listening, which is uh, listening to the word, to the Bible, and listening to the world, to culture, so that we can speak in a relevant way into culture. So that we're not a church that are just focused on the Bible, and neither are we people uh, just of the world, but we can stand in that gap and speak in a relevant way. And um, really he founded the Institute because he was concerned um, that the evel evangelical church was um, really producing a lot of Sunday Christians, you know, people that just live um, one day of their lives for Jesus and then sort of get on with the rest of the week. And his passion was for Christians who live um, with Jesus as Lord of everything, whether that's your family, your work life, your hobbies, everything. Um, so today, under the leadership of Mark Green, who we'll meet later, um, we continue with that uh, vision, and it works itself out in different ways, and one of those ways is a focus on the workplace. So that's kind of where we're up to, and we have this tagline, make a difference wherever you are, so whatever pair of shoes you happen to be wearing. Lydia, why don't you tell a bit about shift. I've got a funny slide because I think that your founder also <laughs> uh, is a man of ambition <laughs> and he's probably in the corner hiding. Uh, hopes to be in Time magazine one day. Tell us about shift. Um, so shift is just officially over a year old. It kind of grew while five of us met at university and our heart was just we didn't, we didn't plan, we didn't have big ideas. We just felt so um, stirred up by when we looked at culture and we looked at um, our friends around us, the lives they were living. So we thought, okay, we'll put a New Year's Eve event on. Um, we started two challenges, one for the guys and one for the girls, just small among our friends to kind of chase purity, counterculture in um, some of those areas. And God has blessed us and it's snowballed. So. Um, we're a growing network of, we tend to range over the ages of 18 to 30, and our heart is to see a shift in me, church, culture. So it's a shift in our lives, how we um, 
how closely we know God, how closely we walk with him, how our generation is involved in church, this attitude of servant-heartedness, but also changing our language and our lives so that when people talk about us, we're known as the generation that is coming back in through the doors. Caleb's going to mention some statistics later that um, it's scary. It can be scary when they talk about us, but we're full of hope. And then this whole idea that there's so many areas of culture that when we seek God in them, our heart with purity is um, where it says, blessed are the pure of heart because they will see God. It's about changing integrity across our lives so that we see God move. For us, that's a real key. So that's kind of, at ICC have this crazy statistic about the amount of hours that we spend at work. And that's it's kind of, yeah, that's kind of where it comes with shifting culture in the small where God's placed us to be faithful, but in the wider too. And we just hope that as our generation grows, that we can see tangible change in those areas. Cool. So one quite established uh, charity uh, with this background and one very fresh, new, uh, working things out charity. But we have this common ground, this shared interest in what it means to be Christians that engage relevantly with culture. So tonight we're going to be looking at the cultures of our workplaces where we spend an awful lot of our working weeks We're going to be looking at um, the small scale, so your team, your office, your organisation, and then later in the evening start to think about the big scale, what are the big things at play in our sectors. I think that's probably all we need to say for now. Um, Can I welcome Mark up? Shall we give him a round of applause? (laughs) Oh, one thing before I hand on. One very small thing before I hand on. Um, We're going to have a QA and a panel later. Um, with Mark and with Caleb, who's speaking later, and with um, Hester, who's on the board here at ICC. And to speed that process up, um, if you think of any questions throughout Mark's talk, throughout what's going on later, there's some yellow slips of paper um, on the floor with your suites. If you can write your questions down, um, that will just speed up the process later on, and I'll collect them as we go. Am I allowed to talk now? You're allowed to talk. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I'm a man under authority, actually. Sarah Jane uh, gave me instructions as as to what to wear for you this evening from my (laughs) enormous wardrobe of things. So this is my my sort of TK Maxx jacket. Notice the trendy, trendy buttons (laughs) on the back. So this is the kind of organisation we submit to to young people out of reverence for Jesus. Actually, the the thing about John Stott that you need to know is that he always had a heart for the young. That was one of the keynotes of his things. He very rarely went overseas except to either quite poor countries or to go and speak uh, to students. And one of the things that he used to do around culture was he had a group of about 10 people. Every four to six weeks, he would meet with these people and and they would go out and watch a film together or um, go uh, have read a book together or go to an exhibition together. And they'd they'd come back to his flat and they'd go around the room and he'd ask these 20 20 something people, so what did you think, what did you think, what did you think? It was in his DNA and uh, it's in ours. So I'm really, really pleased to be here. Great to be working with a load of shifty people as well. That's always been one of my (laughs) things, uh, and um, partly to do with my background, really. Um, So here's a a verse, a keynote verse. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So a bit of personal background. As some of you know, I used to work in advertising, so you can trust every word you hear from me this evening. And, uh, and indeed, you can trust every picture you see from me this evening. <laughs> I, um, I actually became a Christian my last month at university, and then for 10 years lo- uh, in London and, and in New York for most of the time, advertising was my front line, if you like, my daily mission field. And I have to say that over the years, I saw God do wondrous, wondrous things. I saw him answer prayer on prayer. I saw him miraculously heal my boss's secretary on the 10th floor of a Madison Avenue uh, advertising agency. I saw him draw people to himself uh, right there and more than one. I saw him impact the work, the work itself. I saw him um, use me in small ways to shift the culture out there. I saw him protect me and guide me. I saw him teach me um, about service and about humility quite painfully. I saw him mature me, yes. Um, through spectacular character failure. You may or may not have one or two of those. Career disappointment and romantic catastrophe. Um, of course, things have changed since those halcyon days before, before mobile phones and laptops, before Angry Birds and Daft Punk. We, we had real punk back then. 
and, and orange flares. Not everything was great. Things have changed, and as you know, um, and are experiencing, they're shifting quite, quite quickly now. The dynamics, the expectations, the rhythms of the working world have changed, but God has not. So the point about talking about my past is not that once upon a time, in a working world far, far, far away, um, I worked in advertising, you can trust every word you hear from me. The point is that God worked in advertising, and I learned to trust every word he said, and God works in every and can work through every workplace and we can trust his word um, in all those locations. So tonight my brief is to lay some foundations, a uh, sort of warm-up act for, for Caleb, uh, for how we can help, how we can see how God can help us understand the microcultures we're in, our organizations, our teams, uh, the people that we relate to day by day, and how God can perhaps with his help, how we can begin to change those microcultures in his, in his ways. So we want to cheer on the positives and see what we can do about the negatives. So, but before we think about culture in general, understanding it, and your particular workplace or organization or team, um, thinking about how you change that. And then SJ takes us through some applications, a bit, bit of time after I've uh, spoken, to be really think together about how you change things. Here are a few questions just to help begin the conversation. I'm going to ask a question about your workplace, and what I'd like you to do is to tell a person or a couple of people around you uh, what comes to mind and then why. What comes to mind and then why. So the first question is, if your workplace uh, were a car, what kind of car would it be? And for those of you who cannot tell an orange Lamborghini from a VW camper van, if you prefer to use an animal, you can use an animal, okay? So if your workplace were a car or an animal, what kind of car or animal would it be? So instinctively, just have a chat and why. Okay, do I have any, um, do I have any offers? Any, any, uh, any cars or animals that anyone wants to uh, shout out? Any, any cars, any animals? Any cars or animals? Or were you actually just exchanging phone numbers here. <laughs> yeah. A really, really big bus. What kind of bus? Uh, Apart from a really, really big one. Uh, right. Very. <laughs> so are you prepared to tell us who you work for? <laughs> Is this the government? <laughs> it is the government. All yeah, oh, right. <laughs> I, I take it all back. I didn't say that. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Car and animal. What, what comes to mind? Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Well, here's a couple of other questions for you. Um, you might want to write these down on, in the space, or at least your responses in the spaces in uh, the little handout uh, that we've given you. So just think about something you particularly like about the culture of your workplace or organization or your aviary or your bus or your tiger or whatever it is that you um, wrote down. Something you particularly like. And you might want to share that too and then something you particularly dislike. You'll probably know that pretty quickly. Okay, let me stop you there. Um, we're gonna have, you're going to have an opportunity to come back to those uh, later on and reflect more on those, and perhaps some things will occur to you during the evening. Uh, Calvin always began his uh, talks with worship. So what I like to I'm not going to sing, do not worry. I, I can see the faces on my team panicking. He's going to sing. No, he's not going to sing. Uh, could you stand with me? We'll just uh, pray together. <laughs> Spirit of living God, we ask this evening that you would... Uh, 
fall afresh on us, melt us, mold us, fill us, so that we, you might work through us, through us, in the places where you call us each day. We've written down some things that we appreciate and some things that we don't about the places that you've put us. Maybe not all of us are employed at this time, um, but we still have a place where we go, a place where we operate. And so we lift that place to you now. We lift the place where you've put us. And we ask, Lord, that this evening would be part of you enabling us to see it with the eyes of Christ, to love the people with the heart of Christ, and to minister there in a variety of ways as you prompt us by your Spirit, in the power of the Spirit. And we pray for our fellowship, Lord, that um, you've put us around some people this evening, and we pray we'd be able to hear their wisdom and perhaps also hear their heart, and that we would minister together to grow in grace and wisdom uh, for your glory and for the sake of the world that you gave your Son uh, to redeem and restore and reconcile. In his name we pray. Amen. Do sit down. Well, let's look at the overall question of culture for a moment. Here's one definition of culture. Culture is the way we do things around here. Story goes of a group of Vatican prelates who are, us, uh, who are sent to Liverpool to, to meet Archbishop Derek Warlock, a, a, an expert on culture. And uh, they go there, they, they listen to him, they go back to the Vatican. The Pope says to them, so what is culture? And uh, they reply, culture is the way they do things in Liverpool. <laughs> culture is the way we do things round here, which no man Cunian would agree with. Every church has a culture, every workplace has a culture, every family has a culture. Some of it's good, some of it's not so good, some of it's neither one thing nor the other. In the culture of Jesus' times, there were things that he affirmed and there were things that he critiqued. Pharisees making long salutations in the marketplaces and hogging the best seats in the synagogues. And there were things that were neither good nor bad. In Jesus' time, how did he teach? He taught sitting down. We tend to teach standing up. In Jesus' culture, the rich had servants to wash their guests' feet. But I find I just can't get the staff these days for that kind of thing. All, all these cultures, though, are shaped by values. Let me give you a domestic example. I come from a um, very huggy-huggy, uh, slobbery-slobbery, kissy-kissy, Scottish-Celtic-picked family. And um, maybe you come from a family like that. And uh, when I was uh, growing up, my mum had two rules. If anybody comes into our house, there are two things that happen. She kisses it, and then she feeds it. <laughs> That's it. And this was fine till I go, you know, it was fine till I was about eight, nine, ten years old. And then my friends started to come around to our house, and I noticed how uncomfortable they were at the prospect of walking through our front door. And they would come through the front door very tentatively and then looking around to see whether this woman would come and, you know, attack them. And then they'd wash up the stairs as fast as they could to escape her. Now, the point about that was that's just the way we did things around, around us, um, which was slightly countercultural to Southern English culture. But behind that was a set of values. And that set of values was what? Well, a set of values about children. If you are my child's friend, then, and you come into my house, I'm going to hug you, because actually that's what we do around here. I value you, I treasure you, so I'm going to hug you when you come, and I'm going to hug you when you leave. I'm going to feed you. I am in place of your parents, that old idea that many, many cultures used to have. So when you're here, if you misbehave, I may hit you. My mother didn't do that, but you know what I mean? That was the sense. And you know, you hear about uh, people in the East End who always used to look after each other's kids. And some, you know, kid would come home and say, "He hit me," and the father would go, "Whack, whack! He probably deserved it." So you get never tell your father that you've been hit by somebody else because he hit you again. So the point here is, the point of this is, values determine behaviour. What my mum did wasn't just accidental. And you've all got families, I assume, at some point, and therefore, actually. There's a way you do things around there, and it's the same in workplaces. When you're creating culture, there are rituals, there are rewards, there are taboos, there are creeds and proverbs, there are stories. All of these things uh, make up culture. A while back, I was um, at a place called uh, Electronic Arts. Electronic Arts, as some of you would know, is the global brand leader in computer games. They make things like The Sims, they make things like um, uh, FIFA 2013, and so on. And on that particular day, that I was going there to uh, be brief to work with their European management teams on the question of culture and values. 
And they had some awards, and their awards were things like um, most valuable player. Well, you'd expect that. American company, most valuable player. Somebody's going to get a big check and be sent to Tahiti or somewhere for a holiday. Then they had rookie of the year. Rookie of the year, that's interesting, isn't it? So this is somebody who's come in that year. They had five awards for that, not just one. That's interesting, isn't it? They had five rookies of the year. Then they had somebody called Eternal Flame. Somebody been in there a long time, done a good job, which in a media company is about three weeks. And, uh, and then you have Unsung Hero. Maybe there are people like that around you. Maybe you're not old enough to be, or long enough in your organization to be an unsung hero yourself. But those sort of people who kind of, you kind of go, they've been here a while, and they, they do a really good job. They're not front line in the sense they, you know, they may not be the best salesperson, they may not be doing, but actually they do a cracking job, don't they? And often they don't get acknowledged. So there was the unsung hero. And then there was international awareness. American people are often accused of insensitivity to other cultures. So here was an award for somebody who, who was sensitive. So there's values in there. Most valuable player, commitment to high performance. Rookie of the year, affirming new talent as opposed to ignoring it. Eternal flame, valuing long-term loyalty and commitment. An unsung hero, valuing high quality work in low profile jobs. And then international awareness, as I've said. So they reflected a set of values. And what you can see there is that when you, when you get it right, creating culture, everything will be expressed through that culture. So the rewards, and this is a case of rewards, who gets rewarded according to a set of values? What stories do you tell? Well, it's according to a set of values. So the question for us is, as we think about and we pray about how we can bring shalom. That's the extraordinary thing in that Jeremiah verse, that we not only pray for the shalom, the wholeness, the peace, the well-being, the prosperity of the workplace that God has called you to. We seek it. So we leave, it's God and us. It's God and us. God working through us. So what, what's good about the way people do things in your in your workplace? What's not so good? Not only for others, but perhaps for us. In Romans 12, Paul exhorts um, uh, the Christians, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now, Paul knows it is pretty easy to end up behaving like everybody else. A culture tends to make you do that. Gossiping because everyone else does, bad-mouthing the boss because actually that's what we do around here, being cynical about clients, being a bit too concerned about the model of our mobile phone because everyone else is just talking about their mobile phones all the time, buying into the nasty aspects of a competitive culture or whatever it might be. One of the things I noticed in advertising was how many people in advertising were in debt. It's an extraordinary thing, really. They're very well paid people projecting an image of the good life, feeling that they need to get into debt to actually live up to the image that they're projecting. Somehow the values in it had made them behave in ways which weren't great. So we look for ways not only to change our own behavior, but uh, to, to change the way things are done around here. Now there's one caveat to this. It is really, really important to recognize that every workplace is different. Every one of them is a foreign country, and they are all different. So while we're encouraging one another, we've got to be careful about saying, well, I do it here. Well, here may be like, for you, you may be in the equivalent of Italy, where it's really easy to grow tomatoes. You show the soil in Italy a picture of a tomato, and it grows tomatoes. It's really easy. Or you may be in Iceland in terms of its response to, to your kind of values, where it's actually very difficult to grow bananas. Now, you may not to know that Iceland is, in fact, the second highest per capita producer of bananas in, in the European area, which is an extraordinary idea. So it is possible to grow bananas in Iceland. Be encouraged if ever you want to go into that business. The thing here is that what we see in the Bible is God's people, God enabling his people to flourish in a whole, whole set of different cultures, though often in different ways. So take Daniel. Daniel himself goes through three sets of uh, big bosses, and he begins in a culture ruled by a dictator, Nebuchadnezzar, who can do whatever he likes. This is a man who can do whatever he likes. He is not subject to the rule of law at all. So if he wants to throw his entire civil service, kill them all, he can do that, and he threatens so to do. So that's the first guy. Whimsical, I can do what I want. The second guy he works for 
Well, the third guy rather works for her. It's an entirely different system. This man is bound by law, the law of the Medes and Persians. It cannot be changed. So once a law has been passed and he signed it, he himself cannot change it. So that's why Daniel gets thrown into the land's end, even though his boss doesn't want him there. He can't change it. So the critical thing is that God is with us, whatever the culture. But don't project your Italy on somebody else's Iceland or your Iceland on somebody else's Italy. We've got to learn how to help one another operate in these different zones if we can. So what does this look like? Well, let me tell you an example, an example of somebody who's quite junior at the time, this example of a woman called Anita. That's Anita. Anita was a junior research scientist working for a large pharmaceutical company, and uh, the scientists in her team would come in every day, and they were all working on experiments in single unit facilities. Are there any scientists in the room? Not a single scientist. I've got an engineer. I've got one engineer, but no scientist. Well, anyway, imagine, okay? So you're a scientist, and you come in, and you work in a single unit lab. So you're on your own most of the day. And what she notices is that these people almost never talk to one another, and occasionally they would pop out on their own. They'd look around, scurry down the corridor, go to the kitchen, make themselves a cup of coffee, come back in, and get on with their work. That's all they would do. She thinks this is not good. This is not good in two ways. It's bad for the science because no one is sharing any information. And it's bad for team morale because nobody knows anybody. So it's a really bad place to work. So she decides that since she is operating in a culture that does not value relationships enough to make sure they're healthy, what's she going to do? She decides to conduct an experiment. What percentage of research scientists will emerge from their single unit research facility at 10.30 on a Friday morning if they are offered fresh brewed coffee and chocolate biscuits? It's an experiment. And she discovers that 98.374% of research scientists will emerge from their single unit facilities at 10.30 on a Friday morning if offered hot coffee and chocolate biscuits. Now, interestingly, everything got better as a result. The relationships got better because people started to talk to one another. The science got better because they were sharing information, sharing problems, and so on and so forth. Everything got better. Six months later, Anita left the company and no one else took the initiative to make coffee at 10.30 in the morning. Six months after that, the company had to bring in a management, a management consulting company to do team building exercises in the evening. It cost them an absolute fortune when all they needed was a packet of hobnobs. <laughs> so what's the, what's, what can we learn from this? She identified an issue. What's your issue? What's the one thing you think that you might... You can't change it all. You can't change IBM by next Monday. Well, maybe you can, but it's tough. What's, she identified an issue. She doesn't accept the status quo. It doesn't have to be this way, does it? And she looked for what you might call a kingdom antidote. Now, the kingdom antidote happens to be coffee and chocolate biscuits, but it's actually, what is the kingdom antidote? It's a relational antidote. It's basically saying, how does God want us to treat other people? What kind of quality of relationships do we want to have here? So she seeks to do something which enriches the quality of the relationships. Now, her strategy was a cup of coffee and some chocolate biscuits. Another might be just to go and sit, choose to sit once a week on the edge of somebody else's desk near their cubicle. It might be to decide to walk to the sandwich shop once a day or once a week with somebody. In other words, how do you, I'm not telling you what to do because it'll be different for you. But what her point was, quality relationship is not good. How do I enhance it? Actually, quite simple. Quite simple. So what's going on for you? I mean, what's going on? Is there a lot of gossip? A lot of bad-mouthing of people? Apparently, that is a very, very big issue for many people. How do you come up against it? Well, one guy who works in a very well-known media company, quite young, was in, was in exactly that kind of bad-mouthing culture. Everybody yakking against everybody else uh, behind their backs. And so when people said things like this, well, you know, said those sorts of things, he'd say, well, they may have done that to you, or they may have said something like that to you, but I have to say they've never done anything like that to me. And it got to the point after a while that whenever anybody would gossip about anybody else, they'd come and say, you know, blah, 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 so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. But of course... They've never done anything to you. <laughs> so it became something of a sort of semi-joke. 
The first, pers first Christian I saw change a culture was uh, a, a young guy who was a new recruit at Ogilvy Made in New York. He was 22 years old. His name was Ted Cobden. He was the son of a pastor. Uh, he actually wasn't that great at advertising. He was clearly, but he was good. And everyone wanted him to succeed. So uh, he was just a nice guy somehow. And uh, after a while, I started to notice that no one swore around him. Now, he never said anything. He never looked askance. You never saw him flinch when somebody said something untoward. It wasn't a particularly bad, you know, foul mouth culture at all, but he never did it. Just after a while, I thought, this is really peculiar. This very junior guy, and around him, no one seems to swear. Now, I'm not saying that's our goal in life, to stop people swearing. There are bigger fish to fry. People are, you know, <laughs> people are lost. You know, there are bigger fish to fry. But it was extraordinary. Something about him. So, it may not happen like that for you, but it can, it can happen. You might simply just decide to have a high value of people, to honour people that other people don't honour, to care for people who other, other people don't care for, to good mouth people when they do things. Who knows? Have a high value for people. But apart from people, is there a system? Is there a system that just doesn't seem right? Something that everybody does it and... Uh, but it's not right. So here's something that a friend of mine came up against. He was in something called purchasing, and it was the 21-day lie. The 21-day lie goes like this. So he's purchasing. So he's calling somebody up and saying, can you deliver these widgets for me by May 1st? And the person says, yes. And actually, the person on the other end line thinking, I can't actually deliver them by May 1st, but I'm pretty sure I can get them there by May 22nd. Can you get them there by May 1st? Sure, sure, no problem. Because he knows on April 15th, he'll call up, oh no, they're a bit, de a bit delayed, and so on and so forth. So within this culture, there was the 21-day lie. And everybody kind of knew this was going on. But actually he decided, no, 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 I want my yes to be yes, and, my, and their yes to be yes, because that's the way it is. Tell the truth. What's the truth here? So he told all his suppliers that this is what he was going to do. I want to know the real day. 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 Now, that's one thing when you've got the power. So after a while, people got, became used to it. They realized he was serious. People started to lose business. He was serious. But then something happened. He realized he was going to be late for something. Now he's in trouble. And he realized, you know, he was not going to be able to deliver something he had promised to his boss. He was going to be significantly late. But he knew, he knew this four days or so beforehand. So what do you do? What does your culture do when something's going to be late in your culture? What do the people do? Well, most people say nothing. They just uh, carry on, try to get it done as soon as possible after the deadline, and hope that nobody notices. Unless it's something like, you know, you're driving a bus. <laughs> The 21-day lie doesn't quite work. So what did he do? He went to his boss and said, I'm going to be late. I'm very sorry, it's going to be late, and I can't get it done on time. His boss was completely flabbergasted. Could not believe that someone had actually come to apologize for, for, for something being late before it was already late. And, he, and so he asked him, when do you think you can get it done by? He said, I think I can get it done by X date. And he said, thanks very much, that will be fine. So, as you were saying, there's the change in us, as well as the change in the culture. He wanted his yes to be yes. He had a high value of truth telling. He wanted to run his part of the business that way, but it had an implication for him. For him. Maybe your culture is very materialistic, and very self-focused. Well, how could you make it less so? Well, maybe there's a Christmas party and you have a raffle, and you say, let's, let's, have, let's, let's give some money to some orphans uh, or in Eastern Europe or in Africa, let's build a well, add five pounds to the ticket, and let's build a well in Rwanda or whatever it might be, or let's, or let's, let's give to, to the receptionist's favorite charity. So you go to the receptionist, somebody relatively low in the organization, saying, what's your favorite charity? And he or she says, it's X, and then you do that. Can we find an antidote? Can we find an antidote to what's going on? Culture is the way we do things around here the working practices, the structures, the personal values, the behaviors, the stories, the rituals. Now, there's good news and bad news. 
because culture expresses itself in all these different ways, from the notices to the policy documents, everything, because it does all of that, it means that actually all of them are an opportunity for us to change something. That's what it means. We can begin with something. The bad news, of course, is because culture expresses itself in all those ways, it's pretty hard to turn around a big culture just through one of those things. But we begin, don't we? We begin to find something that goes slightly against the grain. And we do it prayerfully, humbly, lovingly, perseveringly. We plant a mustard seed so small you might not even be able to see it. But over time, mustard seeds grow, don't they? Mustard seeds grow. May it be so for each one of you wherever God has placed you.